Hi everybody, it's my great pleasure to introduce Peter Strassens. I've uh, known Peter since uh, my second year of university in 92 um, and worked with him for about, I think it might be about seven years from 2000 to early last year. Uh, he's going to give us an overview of the interesting stuff they're doing at computer science at the ANU now. Thank you, Bill. Well, my slides are available here. You can see the hyper hyperlink, and if there'll be probably sections that we have to skip over and stuff like that, and there are embedded hyperlinks. So this might be useful to some people. So I'm part of the Department of Computer Science, and we've recently formed ourselves into a group, computer systems group, and I'll just give an overview of what we could be covering today. OK. We have OpenMP, virtual APG clusters, NUMA simulation tools. These are kind of three topics which we could easily spend half an hour on each. So with that and the overview, plus multiple core computing, um, that really only leaves us a choice of one. So I was just wondering uh, what the audience which one of OpenMP, virtualized HPC cluster, and NUMA simulation tools you'd prefer? Or we could try and do two and, and skim over them. Virtualized HPC clusters. OK. All right, so this is a computer system group. And in order to found our group, we decided to get a photograph of ourselves. Um, that, that's quite recent, in fact. Up until that time, I didn't realize how dark a clothing all my colleagues seem to wear. But anyway, we're five academics. Uwe Zimmer, he, he works in robotics, and this is real robotics, not sort of software agents, which, which I made the mistake of calling robots once to him. And he has submarines which swim, and they swarm, and they talk to each other. And he also has autonomous aircraft, as indicated below. Bioengineering is a new, new project. It's with IBM. And my colleagues Alistair Rendell and Stephen Blackburn are involved. And basically, the application is ion channels in cells. These are the things that are responsible for the transfer of electrolytes in and out of cells. And in biology, they're extremely important things to study. Now, they're looking for tools. They're looking for algorithms. They're looking for implementations. They're looking at GPUs and the cell processor. And they're also looking at extending X10 to implement these algorithms from a higher level. Stephen Blackburn also works in, in Runtime systems for modern language, object oriented languages, and he does lots and lots of work on, on that as well. Performance analysis this is where, where Bill was a long member of this project. Alistair Rendell leads this, and sorry, he doesn't lead this, the next one. Uh, I've been leading the, the work in, in Simulator, and we have a, we've developed a Spark Simulator, which I won't get to tell you about now, but also, as part of that, Stephen Blackburn looks at benchmarking, benchmarking of J Java. His conclusion and he, he, that of his colleagues is that the standard Java benchmarking d suites are way out of date. They're sort of appropriate for five or 10 years ago. And a very large project that he's been involved with is the, the, the Kappa project, which um, He, he's part of and is doing proper benchmarking on, on workloads that are representative of real day uses. Okay, so parallel computing, this is the, the CC NUMA project that's computational chemistry on non uniform memory access. And Alistair Rendell leads that, and Bill and myself are involved in some of that, that as well. Bill, Bill worked on the interval arithmetic, which is part of that. Looking at 
harnessing the cell broadband broadband engine and the GPUs for doing scientific computations. There's cluster open NP, and Alistair Rendell is the main player, but I also work in that area as well. And, and also on trying to use a service-oriented architecture for traditional high-performance computing. OK, so operating systems, and I guess this is what we'll concentrate on today, how to use virtualization in conjunction with high-performance computing, and in particular clusters. And my colleague, Eric McCreeth, has also done some Linux kernel development. OK, we have a teaching program, but I think we'll, we'll skip over that. It's, but we're just proud of that we were able to support our reach at, uh, use our teaching to support our research activities as well. OK, so I'll just talk a little bit about the, the clusters because that is related to the, the, how we're using virtualization because this is, this is the platform that we, that we use. So we have a, a, a kind of a project which, which encompasses th this work called the Jabberwocky project. And the idea of the Jabberwocky is that it's like a, the mythical monster made of parts of many different things. You, it's got all these different subclusters, and if, it, if anyone recognises these names, these, this is from Lewis Carroll's poem. And there's a, there's a hyperlink to that as well. And it's growing, and recently we've included an infini, small infinity band clusters made from, from Sun um, dual node servers, quad core servers, I should say. OK. Well, before getting into what we do, I just would like to give you the motivating scenario. And the idea is that you have a compute center, and this compute center is serving more of the traditional scientific engineering applications rather than commercial applications, although it could be just as well commercial applications in, in several respects as well. Your compute center. It's going to be heterogeneous, inevitably, and the basic model is that you have uh, multi-clusters of homogeneous subclusters of different kinds, different processing elements, different interconnection networks. And the idea is that we want to develop runtime environments which um, will run a parallel job and according to the particular needs on, on the, uh, and the demands on the, on the multi-cluster, and be able to move that jobs as, as conditions change, and move them intelligently for various purposes. So you, if a, a subcluster which is better for the current job becomes available, you can migrate it to that. Um, you might be interested also just in simply load balancing, and you might be also interested in consolidating. Once a job becomes fragmented over, over the multi-cluster, you might want to bring them together when the processes become available. OK. So the approach is basically we, we, we develop the infrastructure to monitor the job with low overhead as it runs, determine at runtime its, its characteristics, both in terms of computationally, in terms of memory, and in terms of communication. Well, if we're going to move them, we need some mechanism for that in virtualization because it encapsulates what's going on much better than, than the process level is, is an obvious candidate for that. Virtualization is also important because the users of, of the data center will have their own virtualized environment, and many codes will only run on a particular version of Linux and glibc and, and whatever. And they can customize their environment, which is also important in this context. So there are the two advantages of virtualization. The question is, can you make this efficient? And can you make use of migration successfully? OK. So looking at the first problem, can you 
can you have communication running efficiently under virtualized environments? And that brings us into a more general problem. We have clusters made of multiple CPUs. I don't mean SMP um, in the strict traditional sense. These could be multi-core systems. Typically, they'll have multiple uh, network interfaces. And it's a rough coincidence, but there's, there's at, at present, a, a parity between the number of interfaces and, and the number of, of CPUs. So the idea is, can you make use of giving each CPU, for example, a dedicated interface, and will that scale? OK. So on, a, on our machine, we have this particular kind of Opteron mo motherboard. And we, we have four CPUs, and well, there are six slots, and because we, you need to keep one for control, we, we can use four of those slots for dedicated communication channels. The gigabit Ethernet, in principle, of course, it doesn't matter whether it's gigabit, InfiniBand, or whatever, but one ad advantage of, in infini of, of Ethernet is that it's widely used and it's quite reliable. And can you use this in conjunction with virtualization? OK. So uh, just a little bit about background in, in Zen. Virtualization, um, people are speaking of its advantages. We have a renaissance in virtualization over the last few years. And it's, Zen isn't the only one, but it happens to be the particular one we're working on. But most people have been pessimistic about the performance overhead introduced by virtualization. OK. So in virtualization, basically, you, you have the hypervisor, which normally will have the direct access to the devices. And the communication is slowed down, because when you want to uh, communicate from a virtual, uh, virtualized operating system, which is also called a guest, it has to communicate first to the hypervisor, transfer pages over to it, then it through a virtual interface, then it goes out through the physical interface. And there, obviously, you're going to get some overhead in that process. OK. So under Zen, there are several guest operating, operating system, but one sits, sits primarily on the machine and can access the hardware. It sits beneath the hypervisor as, as well, but it's, it is special because it's the one that actually does the communication and does the device access, which is domain zero, the drive to domain. OK. So it manages, manages all, of, all of the cluster, and we get this data transfer, which is potentially slower. OK. Well, just something that, that's relevant to this when we talk about performance is basically how Linux, or for that matter, any other operating system, under multiple CPUs trans processes TCP IP. OK, there are several papers on this. And if you go to my home page and look at my paper, I've got references to the papers that have done studies of this. But basically, once you've got a single stream uh, TCP connection, you can logically break that down into, um, into sub sub messages and send those individual sets of packets over different interfaces. That's typically called ch channel bonding. Has anyone heard of channel bonding? A few people. Has anyone heard anything good about it? Well, I haven't. And all, all, all of our experiments sort of show that it basically sucks. A more successful strategy is connection parallel, and that you try and use independent messages. And you can, you can get much better performance. And that's also confirmed by our, our experiments as well. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, that's a very uh, interesting question. It was basically that with OpenMPI, when you have a large message, it can actually make use of multiple con um, com communication channels. That's, that's very correct, and indeed we'll, we'll actually see some results and we'll see how good the performance is. It's a very, very clever thing about OpenMPI implementation, how they've done this. It does work. Okay, so what we have here is with multiple interfaces, um, it's work that I began with Richard Alexander and, and, and David Barr um, about two years ago and it's carried on by Sultan and Mohammed Atif and we've got a paper in Zen HPC 06. And basically, this is not the only way you can do Zen, but you can have one virtualized node on each CPU. And what you can do in Zen is that the normal way of connecting it is that the ethnaut on the guest goes through a Zen bridge and that basically goes out to the physical ethnaut. But it's possible to configure it differently. For example, guest two, the ethnaut can be connected to a different Zen bridge and can go on, out on the physical ethernet one. So in this scenario, you could have guest two and guest naught both communicating at the same time through separate physical interfaces. Alternatively, if you could have guest naught and uh, guest naught and guest one, they could be communicating through the same interface. And of course, you'll get contention for that physical resource in this case. Okay. Now, we want to compare this with native Linux because that's going to be our baseline. And of course, you can do the same kind of thing with nat native Linux with ETH1 directly connected to a process, which is under domain, for example, a process two instead of guest two and a process naught, both un running under domain naught. And these could go up through separate interfaces. Okay. So now we can get to see, see some results. And I apologize for these tables, they look a bit awkward. But this is latency in microseconds for short messages. And low is good, high is bad. OK, we have two versions of, of, of native under two different MPIs. And when you're using multiple interfaces, as, as from, from your question earlier, um, the two versions of MPIs work very differently. Open MPI basically we'll take a single message, large message, and try and, and, and break it up and use both interfaces simultaneously. So for example, if you have, what we have is two cluster nodes here, four processes communicating to their opposite pair on the other side. Um, each potentially can be using a different interface to communicate. So, for example, with four pairs, we have the four processes and they're all trying to communicate. And this is in megabytes per second. This is the performance that we're getting for large message, message size. Now, MPICH works differently. Uh, what you have to do is by adjusting the routing tables you can, and using multiple IP addresses, you can get separate MPI processes running on domain naught to use separate interfaces. Bit of a trick, but it's explained in our paper. Now, exported interfaces is one of the Zen configurations, and what you can do in Zen is give a physical interface to one of the guest domains. You can bypass this inefficient communication. Uh, shared bridge is the default Zen configuration, and there you're use, only using a single interface. Um, with separate bridges, you can potentially be using all interfaces. So what do we see? Well, firstly, we can see a significant difference between the two versions of MPI on native. And that's, that's again quite interesting. Secondly, you can see that the exported interfaces quite often does well. It quite often outperforms the native. Not by a huge factor, but it's basically boils back to Linux TCP IP stack processing. Here you've completely uh, separated the stack processing between the, the four processes. Uh, you effectively paralyzed that much more efficiently. You're getting much less cache solutions, you're not getting any contention on locks, which, you, which what you're having under the native Linux running four separate processes. 
OK, you'll see that the shared bridge doesn't scale very well. In fact, since you're using only one interface, that's not surprising. Separate bridges, you get some performance, but again, it's not spectacular. I'll just explain the OSU benchmarks. Latency is ping pong. Bandwidth is where you're trying to shove data down one channel in one direction as, as hard as you can. Bidirectional bandwidth is trying to move data simultaneously in both sides of, in both directions across a, a, a physical Ethernet link. And because Ethernet is bidirectional, you can see some improvement in by bandwidth over, over bandwidth. OK. Well, that's using the, the interfaces between cluster nodes. How about communication within, within a node? Well, here we've got pairs of processes, like on the, the diagram previously. For example, whoops, we could have guest 01 communicating through guest 00. That's going to go through the Zen Bridge Nort through this path here. And of course, we don't expect that to be very fast. OK. So using separate bridges over shared bridges, the separate bridges actually makes it, makes it much worse. Shared bridges, though, this is the bandwidth of, of, of the native operating system. That's running on the shared memory transport. It's very fast. Exported interfaces, that's running, going through the Ethernet interfaces in loopback mode. And you can see the difference between, between loopback mode and the native shared memory transport. And you can see that the virtualized, we are experiencing a significant performance penalty in our communication. Now, when we go to application level benchmarks, then we do see that the separate bridges can be quite bad. The shared bridges, in fact, isn't as bad as you might expect from the micro benchmark. And um, for some reason, the exported interface is actually not on that graph. But I believe it's, it's better than the, than the um, shared bridge. OK. So what about when we, we have a truly parallel benchmark across cluster nodes? Now, we have four, four nodes, and we have the dominant communication is going on within a node. Or, but there's some communication going across between the nodes. So what happens under that situation? Well, again, the baseline of, of native Linux, which is in blue, then we can see that the difference isn't that no longer that convincing. And in particular, if we look at exported interfaces, a lot of places the penalty is small, and even in, in this, in the, for LU, it's negative. Uh, Muhammad also devised a combination hybrid interfaces which can only run under NPICH, and it also performs very well. Now, the exported interfaces is not migratable, whereas this one is, these others are migratable um, configurations, so th there are, that makes them of more interest. So there doesn't seem to be a compelling case for um, for improving communication performance under Zen for Zen guest domains on the same physical host from these results. And that's an optimistic result, which I haven't seen people quote before. OK. Nonetheless, we did that benchmark too late. If we'd done this about a year earlier, we perhaps would not have wasted so much time on trying to do it. I'll just go through this quickly, because it's a bit of a diversion. But there are a few lessons that we learned here. OK, Zen Socket came out last year. And Susan McIntosh from IBM, um, she wasn't the original author, but she, she took it up, the project up, and made it ready for distribution. And it's a pseudo socket form of communication. It's only one-way socket. There's no polar select. And we thought that in open MPI, inside, you can have various, uh, inside MPI, you can have various um, by tra transfer layers, it can be, for example, TCPIP, it can be for Binipan, it can be for shared memory. 
We thought we'd create our own one, which is a version of TCP IP, but using Zen sockets when you could detect that the virtualized processes were running on the same physical host. And in principle, it looked like it'd be possible to migrate this because this has a built-in mechanism that if a socket breaks, which would happen if you migrate the virtual machine, it would try and reconnect automatically. OK, well, Mohammed spent a good six months on this, and working with OpenMPI internals is not at all nice. So my recommendation is don't go there unless you're very, very brave. And in the end, it was only robust for blocking MPI, non-blocking, because it re relies on all these callback mechanisms, which are very, very touchy. It's very, very hard to debug. Um, and then the performance wasn't particularly impressive. ZenSocket by itself is quite fast, but once you put it inside this BTL and you have these complicated protocols that you're following, it slows it down quite a lot. So there must be a better way, but we leave that as an open, open issue. OK. So now we'll get to the scheduling framework, which is kind of actually what Muhammad should have been working on all, all the time. OK. So we have this virtualized multi-cluster with all these sub-clusters on them. And we have a, a file system, which is NFS mounted. In fact, AOVs has, have proven uh, better than NFS for this purpose, and we're using that. OK. So the scenario is that each parallel job runs on its own VM. We don't have VMs with multiple CPUs. And the reason for this is it enables migratability uh, to be most easily facilitated. If you've got a two CPU um, uh, guest operating system, then it might, it's harder to migrate than simply one. OK. Well, if you read Zen literature, the migration downtime, that is the time that, that the virtual machine, if you're trying to contact it, actually is stops responding is, is quite short, only 75 milliseconds. But that isn't the actual overhead of migration. One of the things we, we wanted to do was actually find out how long it would take a, a parallel job if you're running it and you'd migrated one node. OK. So what we would like to do is we could run our jobs on this subcluster and be able to migrate it if if the conditions in the clusters change and we, we see an opportunity to move it to a better place. Well, how do we do this? We have to capture on, on the fly the, the runtime characteristics of the job. Under Zen, the, the mechanism that we, you have to use is Zen O-Profile, which is the Zen version of O-Profile. And for basically CPU characteristics, that's what you can use to capture using the hard, hardware event counters. Currently, you can only capture four at a time on the AMD, and then you have to manually change the counters. For example, you could count CPU, cache, uh, floating point operations, cache, top level cache misses, second level cache misses, and something else. But if you wanted to measure different, different events, then you would have to manually change the counters. And of course, that's not going to work. So waiting on multiplexing, which is expected soon to come into Zeno Profile in which case you could just multiplex over large sets of event counters. So that gives you the CPU and memory characteristics. For the communication characteristics, it's relatively easy to put a profiler. OpenMPI is designed to, to put a profiling level. And you can basically get statistics on the number of calls, particular functions, the, the average message length that you used on those calls. And in that way, you can easily build up a communication profile. Using that. Information, you can in principle determine whether it's your job is floating point limited, whether it's memory limited, whether it's communication limited, and choose a subcluster which may be a little bit better to run it on at that time. One slight problem is that Zen deliberately tries to make this hard for you to, to actually find what physical host you're running on and, and what physical hosts are elsewhere, but there are ways that you can bypass that. Okay.
All right. So basically, in diagrammatic form, this is simply uh, what we, we covered on the previous slide. But you have your MPI application, and you have a profile built into the MPI runtime that goes into your, your data store. You also have the O profiler getting information resource manager that also gets extracted and then sends down to a global data store. This runs on domain zero, and which also runs a scheduler. The scheduler can control where the virtual machines are running and can automatically perform the migration. And it will also use information about the, about the physical hosts in order to guide its decisions. OK, so migration experiments. If you can decide whether it's, it's better to move your job to a different subcluster, you would also need to have an idea of how long this job is going to run for and how long it's going to take you to do the migration to see whether it's worthwhile. If you believe the job is, going to, is a short-lived job, is going to finish soon, then you're better off leaving it, leaving it where it is, for example. OK, so it could vary from the virtual machine memory size and the apparel job's memory footprint and how communication intensive. So this is some preliminary results on the high performance Linux benchmark. We've used this because you can easily change the memory footprint of the, the job. And our result is that it doesn't really matter, the memory footprint of the job, which suggests that with Zen migration, you're just ma migrating all of the pages, whether they're in use or not, which is inefficient. I've recently visited the University of Toronto. They have a project called the Snowflock Project. Now, it takes 15 to 20 seconds to migrate a machine as measured by the increase of execution time of, of a parallel job. They have got it down to sub one second, which is a pretty astounding result. But this is not migration, this is cloning, which is a slightly easier problem. Nonetheless, many of those techniques that they use could be applied because I suspect that when Zen migration, it's doing a lot of useless page copying when you migrate the machine. Okay, so this is my PhD Muhammad's work on virtualized clusters. And this is going to keep him busy for the next two years or at least till the end of till his scholarship money's run out. And I hope that that won't be shorter than two years because I think it's a, a very big and challenging task. Okay. Well, we do have some time. Um, I can just, the multi-core stuff I'd like to get to, but that's only like five minutes worth. Uh, are there any questions about, about the virtualized clusters work? Or any suggestions? We would, we would really like some feedback if you, if you have any suggestions. Yes? Okay. The question was, what kind of scheduling algorithm would we use? Well, that's, that's a very good question. And we're, uh, we're going to start off with first come, first serve. But that um, is just the basic thing that you get within, with inside um, a typical application to just Maui. Um, Mohammed's already uh, prototyped all of this implementation, and I believe he's using Maui. But the thing is that, that for what we want to do is different to the scheduling that you, you get out of these default scheduling infrastructures, because it, it is a choice that um, it, it's where, where to schedule, not, not so much when, is, is, the, is the main issue. So that's really something that Mohammed and I will have to, to think about a lot more, um, the scheduling algorithms to use. Another question? Yes, that was that's the Snowflock people at the University of Toronto. Ayal Delara and Michael Bridno um, 
lead that project, and Andres, I forget his surname now, I met them last week, uh, he's, he's the crack PhD student who got then running. That, that was for migration, that's, that's simply much e sorry, that was for cloning. So cloning is in some sense easier because you're just making a, a copy. Well, migration, in a sense, you're making a copy as well, but um, what they can do uh, with cloning is they're not cloning one at a time, they're cloning a whole heap of them at a time. And they're using uh, Ethernet broadcast, for example, to do that, and they're using all these, these techniques. To, but yes, their, their work is very, it's very good and Ah, this is the other, the other thing. They freeze the virtual machine before they copy it, which is, again, a diff different in t terms of Zen than simply migrating it. So there are differences, but there is still a lot we can learn from, from their techniques. And I think it's, it's a very interesting achievement what they've, they've used. Okay, well, we might just just have a quick look at OpenMP then on clusters because what I would like to, to do is just show you, the, the, what, give you an idea what the state of the art rather than go into the details. Well, people have been talking about cluster OpenMP and how we have to have high level language programming language models for clusters and how terrible MPI is. I can't understand that bit about MPI myself, but then I've had 10 years experience in it, so I'm not the, the typical person who's suddenly confronted with the job of having to paralyze a big application. Okay, so we have two PhD students, Jia Kai uh, and Jin Wong, and Alistair Rendell is also, uh, she supervised Jin, I supervised Jia. And we have two cluster, DSMs, this is the first cluster OpenMP product, came out last year. Um, and Jin has developed another, another system. So Omni is the compiler, and basically it compiles down the original code into, um, well, you, you can visualize it as intermediate level code with calls to a, um, a software distributed shared memory library, runtime library, and that's called Danui. Okay, so basically they're working on trying to get the performances acceptable using various different methods. That's basically the thrust of this, this project, of both of their things, and using different approaches. Jin is concentrating on the runtime system G is more or less using what cluster OpenMP is, but he is looking at using InfiniBand and whether these fancy features InfiniBand can cut down the page fold overhead, which is the dominant overhead of, of these things. So with just with the page fault, what happens is that each pr process sees the whole shared memory space in, in theory, but each, in, each process on a cluster doesn't necessarily have all the global um, global address space mapped into its memory. When it first touches a page, it will get a page fault. And it will have to fetch the page from other parts of the cluster in that case. And that's what gives you all of your overhead. OK. So this is kind of, I guess, the last kind of techniques you can try before sort of saying, well, is this approach viable or is it not? So it'll be interesting to see what comes, comes, comes out. OK, well, I'll skip through, through all of this. Um, and we'll just get to the results. OK, so we want to compare MPI, which is a baseline, for the NAS parallel benchmarks. And these are tough benchmarks. They're not easy things to parallelize, at least some of them aren't, with cluster open in P versions. So these are actually different codes, they're actually different algorithms. And in some sense, the comparison isn't fair because a lot more effort has, has actually gone into these algorithms, the MPI versions and the OpenMP. Okay, embarrassingly parallel, well, no big deal. It's designed so that's gonna scale pretty damn well and shame on you if you can't get that to scale. But here we have the SP benchmark and we're, we're talking about a small cluster. 
OK, we'll open in P just scales, and it's a little bit better on BT, but you can see cluster open in P doesn't. It does, MPI does well on the LU benchmark, but cluster open in P doesn't have it. And MPI, at least class C, does well at integer sort, which is a very short benchmark. It also does well on conjugate gradient, which is rather less short, but as you can see, cluster open P doesn't perform very well. OK, well, these are also preliminary results, but um, in fact, these are all on InfiniBand. Does InfiniBand help you much? Well, it helps you a little bit, but in terms of actually getting a speed up, and with parallel computing, if you don't get a speed up, you wasted your time. OK, there's just no prizes for not getting a speed up. In fact, they, Jin and G sort of said, oh, we improve our speed up by 25%. And I, I say, are you still under one? And they say, yes. Well, I say, well, keep, keep working on it. So even on a small scale clusters, can we improve these systems enough to get, to get speed up? That's the interesting question that we'll see in the next two years. The other issue with cluster open MP is memory usage. So one reason why we run computations on clusters is the memory requirements for your parallel, for your total job is too big to fit in one node. If that's the case, you can run it in distributed memory over cluster and then with enough nodes it will fit in, into memory and it will go much faster. That's another reason for parallelization. Well, unfortunately, with cluster open in P, it has a master node which has to keep a copy of the whole mem memory space. It may not be up to date at any time, of course, but it has to keep a copy. And that does not scale. Now, there's no fundamental reason for that, except that you're, if you're going to try and do it otherwise, you're going to pay more in performance. And you're going to have to do a lot more work. However, on the slave nodes, which is the, uh, the, other, the other nodes, the memory performances, you, you do pay a hit once you get up to um, a distributed OpenMP version, but then it does scale. OK. So we might just get close to the end. And I'd just like to talk about briefly my ideas about multi-core computing and some, and some research directions and possibly get some suggestions from you. OK. Now, this is a slide which from a person that Bill will remember fondly, Robin Stanton, put up a long time ago when we were visiting Fujitsu. We had a collaborative project in the 90s with Fujitsu working with the parallel computers. It was a, it was a great experience being on that project. Bill came aboard on the sort of last four years, like it ran for about 13 years. It's a long project. He came on board for the last 13 years, and I believe he actually had a small involvement even before then. And um, after year one, I was involved. So anyway, this is this. I don't know who, who thought this up, but this is this graph here represents well. People in parallel computing, what are their beliefs? Should you try and get speed by increasing your parallelism, or should you just simply lazily rely on Moore's law to get your processor speed up? Now, this, I first saw this in the early, well, just towards the mid-90s, and the killer micros were coming out. And it, in, indeed, there were true believers, but it seemed to be the days of the agnostics, and even the heretics were starting to, to get a bit of, bit of a show then, because Moore's laws was just doing for commodity processes um, amazing thing and just by increasing the clock speed you could get your increases in performance but sorry that should be mid 2000s multi-core it's changed again and I've always been a true believer and I think the day of the true believers and other true believers has at last come and indeed, if you look at the UltraSpark T2, which, which I'll talk about in the next slide, 
It could even be the day of the, of the phonetics, and you know, I might join them. <laughs> the original graph didn't have any, any um, art pointing down here, but I believe that you could have the Luddites down there. Okay. Well, sort of one of the uh, nice things that happened to me th this year is that I had a dream of getting a T2 um, cool threads processor for my universities for teaching and research, and I've been lob lobbying firstly through Professor Christina Quifentes, who, who works at the University of Queensland and in, in Sun Labs, and then once you got Steve Heller, which is a, who is the director of research at Sun Labs on my side. The dream pretty swiftly became a reality. So, um, it's all, the machine is also called the Ni um, Niagara. You'll see that that's, you recognize that as Niagara Falls, and it's quite a nice photo. If this damn tourist hadn't gotten the way of the camera, it'd be a very good shot, in fact. Anyway, I'm calling our machine Mavericks, and our Spark. In our research network, our sparks, they've been mostly donated by Sun. We are, we've had Palo, we have Auto, we have uh, Alcatraz, and we had Fremont. And I, I was thinking, what in the Bay Area has this water theme? So who's heard of Mavericks? Yeah, what's Mavericks? Big waves. Big waves, and where is it? It's off the coast. It's actually pretty well adjacent to here. So one of the biggest waves in the world. And in case you're wondering the scale of this thing, um, those little dots there aren't surfers. They're boatloads full of half dozen people standing up. Now, there are actually two surfers on the wave. One's about here, one's about there. They're just ahead of the white water. <laughs> now you can get a different appreciation for this. And Niagara Falls, if you go under the journey under the falls, you can feel the ground shaking from the falls. Well. It said that the seismograph at Berkeley can pick up each individual wave breaking when it's this size. So I think it's, it's quite a, it fits in quite well with the theme. So that's why I called it Mavericks. OK. So of course, we can't let our students loose on, on our research networks. The system administrators said that we, we, all havoc would let, let use. But what we can do is use logic domains, and we can export a virtualized machine. It's not exactly the same as Zen, but it's, it's a similar kind of thing, and that's called Wallerman. And Australia is a very poor country for, for, for lots of water moving, unfortunately. And it's, it's getting poorer and poorer as, as the years pass, in fact. But there's Wallerman Falls, which is the highest waterfalls, even though it's not necessarily, uh, in terms of throughput, it's nothing to compare with the, the original. But I'm afraid that's the best Australia can do. OK. so. These are the kind of suggestions. I've also I've looked into the hardware threading. You've got eight true CPUs for eight-way threadings. How effective is that very cheap architectural uh, trick of using hardware threadings up to eight ways? How much does it scale? Well, my preliminary experiments on very simple benchmarks suggest it scales extremely well up to four, and up to eight you still get benefit. And that's on, on a simple benchmark, such so as memory copy, parallel memory copy, or parallel vector reduction. We can evaluate LDOMs. Uh, we can investigate BLAST, which is quite an interesting thing, and a Haskell project. Pascal, Haskell is a very memory intensive programming language. Um, the T2 is particularly well suited to that. Well, if we get time, we could upgrade our simulator to the T2. It currently models the V1280, which is a traditional SMP, over about five years ago. Operating system issues large scale modest core si simulation. And if we, we can look at some of the issues that well, I didn't get to talk to, but some of the issues that Andrew Rover, who's a PhD student that Bill and I super, have been supervising, have come up with a very difficult, much surprisingly difficult topic of parallel processor simulation when you look deeply into it. And another thing which ties into the topic we talked today can you use heterogeneous multi-core, just a small amount of area on the edge of your chip to specialize processes for to aid virtualization and communication under virtualization and eliminate cheaply the overheads that we saw before? 
Hi. Another ANU graduate. <laughs> okay. Well, that uh, basically brings me to the end. Are there any questions? Peter, can you remember the, uh, the T1 processors, as I recall, had very poor floating point um, yes. performance. Does yes. the T2, is the T2 better? The T2 is better. So you act, each real CPU has a real floating point unit. Oh, excellent. So that's much nicer. However, the threads have to share it. The eight threads on that CPU have to, have to share it. So you're, you're really only looking at um, 16 floating point operations per clock. OK. But certainly a lot better. <laughs> Couldn't be worse. <laughs> Uh, it's not really meant to be floating point intensive, but it's, it's really designed, it's designed for, for example, it's got support for encryption and specialised specialized things for that. It's, it's not a scientific machine, even though we'd like to explore how useful it is for scientific computations. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.